Okay, fellas, let's go on a little walk here. Perfect smudge action. We are moving on to the electro winding cell phase, the industrial size unit. Now this is a small test version because I don't have the power, the electricity to run an actual large size unit, but you can increase the size of this particular setup to whatever size you want and this is the uh, volume of electrolyte we're going to be processing i'm going to go ahead and fill this up just a little bit more probably add another gallon in there but um this is the design that we're going to want to use for the electro winding of pregnant solutions and for the processing of spent electrolyte so in this test we are going to electro wind this copper plating solution that was used to make some copper cathodes out of an e-waste anode so it's some pretty dirty stuff this batch here wasn't run for very long at all so it's not as bad as some of these but essentially what we have is um, fluid is injected into this cell at a tangent so that a cyclone forms and swirls the fluid up through the cell completing the mass transfer at the optimum rate, the most optimum rate possible, I guess I should say. And what we have is a lead anode. It goes down inside of this bad boy. Here's a quick clip of what it looks like inside of it. And this here is a stainless steel container with a copper jacket bus bar. So let's get on with it. We've got a cyclone over here. It's going to help us separate out some of those uh, the metals that form on the cathode. We're going to run this at such a high output that it produces a powder, similar to what we see here. Coming on over here, we have the heating mechanism. I've changed it up a little bit. My uh, lab grade heating element came. That's all 316 stainless steel, and it's going to do us a lot better. But this is basically the electro winding stage. What we're going to do is leach this system completely um, dry as much as we can, which is going to leave us with a nickel um, solution. And we are then going to boil that solution to remove as much of the water as possible and add it to, and then use it as the acid that will be added to a nickel bath electrolyte. Since that bath will need acid added to it also, I believe, I'll have to double check that. I could be wrong about the sulfuric in the nickel plating, but that's the plan nonetheless, is to get the nickel out of all of this electrolyte that I have through a nickel refining, nickel electro winding process. Okay, so before I put this together, here is our lead anode. Now the discharge is not a tangible connection, it's just straight on. I kind of regret not making it also a tangent. And just to show you what's on the inside of this, we have a copper starter sheet on the inside of this 316 stainless steel tube that has a copper bus bar jacket wrapped around it. You don't want to be using stainless steel as your conductor it's merely a chemical resistant layer in this case so we have a complete copper jacket 
that is going to be the cathode bus bar. And um, we're going to throw this thing together and electro wind some serious electrolyte. And as I said, we could make this thing as tall and as big as we want. This is basically the simple construction of the electro winding cell. I'm limited in power that I can put out amp wise at the proper volts we need. Yeah, that was a lot of garbage in this electrolyte from the other process. I should have filtered it first. I don't have a filter hooked up to this circuit. Because I'm waiting on parts again. We don't really need it for this stage. This is just to demonstrate how to set up and run the electro winding cell. Basically just having that tangent connection is the key to getting it to work right because the mass transfer depends on that spiral electrolyte motion. I do see what appears to be micro bubbles in there. from oxygen production and hydrogen production. The cathode usually starts producing quite a bit of hydrogen. So we'll let this run for 10 hours at um, 6.7 amps, 4 volts, 6.7 amps. That comes out to 23 milliamps per square centimeter on the cathode. However, that's quite high on our anode. The diameter of the anode is only three quarters of an inch. That's how big around it is right there. I also want to thank a fellow YouTuber who gave me the idea of using O-rings inside of these compression fittings in place of the steel ferrules that come with those kits. That is a phenomenal idea and it has served me well. I tried to dig you up in the comments, brother, to give you a shout out, but uh, I can't find you anywhere. Okay, so actually, I think what I'm gonna do for the first part of the test is just grow some copper, some pure copper out of the solution. Run the thing for about 10 hours. That's probably as long as we'll be able to run it. With, because if the solution becomes too dilute, you'll start powder production at that point, And that'll mess up the crystal anyway. So we'll go ahead and run it slow first. I'm gonna turn on both pumps. A little bit of air in there. Like an idiot, I forgot to turn on the heater thermostat. The reason why you want to run a triac in Liu or in solid state relay setup is because that's a 1500 watt heating element. So when you get up close to the target temperature, the unit starts clicking on and off on you. Uh, when you're turning off a switch that's pulling that kind of power, the line voltage is heavily affected. So it troubles your voltage meter quite a bit. The voltage keeps jumping all around. So you end up with voltage jumping around on this. It can cause a lot of other issues too with other power supplies if you have a lot of these things running. So what I prefer to do is just run the heating element at about 500 watts. That's more than adequate. Um, 1500 watts is just way too much power so I have a 10,000 watt triac that um, basically chops the duty cycle up is all it does. And um, we're using this standard solid state relay with the PID controller to control this temperature. As I said, when I get the rest of the stuff I need, I am gonna set up the bottom of this cyclone to purge itself into something else. And then what happens is all the filth that you see floating around in there will get carried out. Watch that piece there. Maybe we'll see something get sucked back out. But you run the risk of doing that. If you run the cyclone at a very high speed, it will throw out the most particles. However, the turbulence can carry away some of the smaller items. And one of the best ways to resolve a lot of that is to have your discharge cone dump the fluid somewhere else 
It's a very convenient way of degassing a fluid as well. Let's say we had a large oxygen and hydrogen output from this system and we wanted to pull it out of the electrolyte before it hit the pumps again. If you open this valve, all the gas would travel in a spiral cone like a vortex out of the spout. All right, fellas, we've been running for about 10 hours at 6.7 amps, 2.4 volts. We are generating oxygen and hydrogen and probably a little bit of arsenine gas or arsine. I'm gonna go ahead and shut this down. I'm gonna take a look at the crystal. All right, here we go. Moment of truce. See what we got in there. Ooh, check that out. Man, that is so clean looking. I gotta get a flashlight, guys. Here's the anode. It's black, just like we expected. We need to get some cobalt salt to put in here, and that stops that anode from doing that. It's not a big deal. I'll tell you what, though, that is freaking amazing. It really doesn't look bad, guys. If we had some uh, additives in this, like there's no hydrochloric acid or leveler or anything in here. The swirl pattern is in this direction. You can see how I have the starter sheet aligned so that it sheds water. If that seam was facing the other way, we'd probably have some problems. It's starting to oxidize already. That wasn't there a few seconds ago. So we gotta get a look at it quick. I don't know if I wanna pull that out of there or not. Yeah, I think I'll go ahead and pull this out and we'll start over with a fresh sheet. There it goes. Yeah, the bottom wasn't completely flushed up the way it should have been. It was a little short. So it made this little lip on me. Okay, fellas, so I'm gonna throw this bad boy back together. This is the lead anode. And what we're gonna do next is, the reason why I took the copper out now is because when the concentration gets very low, you start to pull out other um, impurities and the cathode gets very dirty looking. We've seen that before in some previous testing. So now we're gonna electro wind this stuff down all the way to a clear liquid almost. Um, it kind of ends up looking like this when you stop pulling anything else out of it. I believe that's a saturated nickel solution right there. That's a test I did previously. But this stuff here has a lot more nickel in it than this material. So I may take half of that out and add some of that high nickel stuff for this test. But that's what we're going to do. We're going to completely electro wine all of the metals out of this material leaving just the nickel behind from what we're told. I have seen some situations where a carbon anode can pull the nickel out, and I do have a carbon, a carbon anode that we'll be testing with also. So this is a three quarter inch graphite anode. I take that back, this is not carbon. It is graphite as far as I know. I'll double check for sure, but Certainly looks like graphite. <clears throat> yeah, I'd say that's graphite. I ordered so much stuff, I can't remember if I found the carbon or the graphite, but the problem with these is ablation. Um, what happens is the material will kind of wet itself and the micro bubbles of hydrogen gas will blister this material apart over time. So they make special graphite anodes that are doped with a resin that kind of um, holds it together to keep that blistering effect from happening as rapidly. It does happen here regardless. That drastically reduces the time. But there are some chemical processes that favor the graphite anode versus the lead anode. And I wanted to be prepared for both. We are going to electro wine solution with the graphite anode as well to observe the benefits or lack thereof. 
because there may be some voltage characteristics that are different. I would imagine we got to run at higher voltage with this. Okay, and I also want to point out in this next test, we're going to be doing rapid deposition where we're doing powder deposition and we're going to collect a stratified layer of material in this cyclone separator here. It's going to start with uh, clean copper, then some dirty stuff, and then iron and all that stuff will be on top of that. So that ought to be cool. And I'm going to show you a couple little beaker experiments that demonstrate what it is that I'm saying to you. We would be producing a lot of hydrogen gas. That's a substantial amount of power going into this thing. One square inch of surface area. I'm going to turn this up all the way and see what happens with turbulence. That thing is just growing rapidly. Notice how the charge accumulates at the points, guys. We discussed this. This could be problematic in the reverse order when you're plating onto the cathode. I am at 36 amps. That wire is about to start glowing red hot. That is just incredible. And look at that. What was that, like 20 seconds? I'm not going to bother weighing it because it's wet, so we would get an inaccurate reading anyway. I'm not too worried about that type of analysis right now. I just wanted to show you guys this because sometimes I do off-the-wall odd tests like this when an opportunity presents itself. Like in this case where I'm about ready to swap out electrolyte and we don't care if I damage it by doing stupid crazy tests that I uh, convinced myself I should do. So yeah, if we pass fluid through the cell at uh, 100 liters a minute or something crazy, we could easily blast this material off of the cathode and then we could do something I'm sure more useful with this copper powder so there you have it like we made that in no time guys